we would like to start this talk with a, a little thought experiment. So we'd like you to think about a system and how you would like to build it. Uh, and the system has to do a very simple thing. It has to be counting number of people going in and out of a room. And it, um, it you can use any kind of technology, gadgets, uh, frameworks, or anything you might uh, want to use. The only thing we would like you to do is to comply with four simple rules. Uh, we would like it to comply, the system you designed to comply with strict privacy policies. So meaning that it does not leak any uh, identity uh, or anything, uh, personal information of any kind uh, of those people passing in front of it to a third party, to the cloud or anything like that. It has to be uh, performing really well. So it has high performance uh, and it has to be quick. So uh, whenever things happen, it should let us know about that. In addition to that, it has to be also relatively cheap to run. While you're thinking about a system like that, we would like to say a few words about ourselves. Hi, my name is Tanlaz. I have a background in robotics and currently working as a cloud engineer for the University of Oslo, where we are building an open source cloud solution for research and education sector in Norway. In my spare time, I do lots of volunteer work and also playing around with IoT devices. And my name is Rustam. I work for a consultancy company called Computas here in Oslo, Norway, and I uh, work mostly with uh, Java, architecture, cloud, and uh, uh, things like that. Um, and in addition to that, I also run a, a cloud developer community here in Oslo. And also, uh, I am uh, traveling uh, quite often to different conferences, doing talks about uh, various topics. In addition to that, I am also a, a Google developer expert for cloud and a Java champion. Enough about ourselves. So let's go back to our example and thought experiment. I think maybe we could solve our problem with IT devices because such devices are cool, easy to set up or accessible, and we can connect multiple sensors to them. So we can use sensors to count and stream. So maybe one of those devices could solve our problem. Exactly. And that was our first thought as well. We kind of thought about that and we thought that probably we should start there. And today we'd like to talk uh, to you about uh, our journey that we had uh, from that moment till uh, something that's working. And we also would like to talk about the uh, choices we had to make on that uh, journey and also uh, um, uh, things that we learned. To do that, we'll probably need to start with uh, uh, giving an introduction of the main uh, concepts that we're going to be using. So um, typically, you, we start from the bottom and you have a uh, an IoT device, a smart device that's being sold to you. And it's uh, usually something tiny little thing with a bunch of sensors and a bit of network connectivity. That's it. Um, on top of that, there is an, uh, the, the, another uh, segment that is a bit more, uh, well, it has a little bit more and a little bit extra. Uh, that is an IoT edge device. We'll explain what extra uh, in, in a few minutes. Uh, and on top of that, as a kind of glue to put it all together, you have a fog and a cloud that we'll also be explaining very, very soon. Um, since we're going to be spending most of our time in the domain of IoT edge devices, we decided to split that into um, three different parts as well. So we have uh, uh, we're going to be talking about the software of those devices. Uh, we're going to be talking about the hardware those devices uh, consist of, and also the architecture, both uh, the architecture for those devices, but also how they kind of fit into your architecture as well. So uh, if we start from the bottom, from IoT devices, uh, I guess we should define that a bit more. Mm -hmm. IoT devices or the Internet of Things, we can say that is the connection between our world and the digital world. So these devices have a connect uh, have a internet connectivity. They collect and generate massive amount of data, send data somewhere else for processing, and then receive the results. And that's fast and great. But there are also some challenges because as the internet connectivity is growing so fast and mobile technology is improving so quickly, our lives become more and more dependent on such devices. And so as the number of these devices grows, 
the security challenges and privacy concerns that may affect our lives will also rise. However, we can say that such devices are great because they give more access and opportunity to more people. Exactly. And since we're talking about the number of devices growing, I think we should uh, show this slide as well. I kind of like this one because it, it sh gives you a bit of a perspective. It shows how these things are growing and also in a perspective. Well, I mean, number of smartphones is growing fine, but how is it compared to other things? And uh, for example, the number of personal computers that you see on the bottom there is actually even slightly declining. Uh, but then you see that most of the other things are actually uh, growing and their projected growth uh, is quite significant, but it's still not as uh, fast and not as special and like super quick as, uh, as the IoT devices, that gray thing you see on the screen there. Uh, oh, it's, 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 it's a kind of totally different world even, right? And since we're talking about the IoT devices, we probably should mention like the good and bad things about them. So positive and negative sides. So the positive sides are, uh, some of them are actually quite obvious, I guess. Um, some of them have been mentioned already. So those devices are usually designed to do uh, very few things, but efficiently. So there are quite fast and quite efficient at what they're doing. So they have low lead uh, time, uh, lead time processing. Um, they have, um, uh, th th they're specialized to do those kind of things. So they're actually specialized to do them fast. Uh, they're also quite accessible because, well, I mean, they're being produced in big numbers. Uh, they're easy to get hold of. There is a lot of different variations of those and stuff like that. Very often they would come with some kind of tracking, uh, functionality, uh, made the, uh, 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 accelerometers, GPSs, and things like that. Those devices and chips are getting smaller, so you can put them in many more things. And sometimes you put them in things that you should not put them into. But, well, you do because somebody thought it might be a good idea, and, well, because we can. Um, since they're being produced in so big numbers, they're also uh, quite cost efficient as well. So they're cheap to produce and they are uh, very, well, again, very small, so they're also being put into all kinds of devices uh, because of their mobility. But not everything is perfect in the world of IoT, I guess. As I mentioned earlier, so security can be a challenge because when we are talking about IoT, we are talking about many devices that interact and communicate with each other. So now we have more hardware and software that can have potential bugs. We have more devices to patch and update, and that makes it more complex. And Privacy can also be an issue because in most of the cases, we send raw data over the network to some servers for processing, and we know both internet and servers can leak data. Uh, these devices collect massive amount of data, and those data and uh, that data need a storage. So that can be pricey if we want to store our data on, on the cloud. And as I also mentioned earlier, uh, these devices depend on the internet. So it means that if we don't have internet connectivity, we cannot use them. And that might be a bit of a problem, actually, because um, um, you know sometimes you don't really have a connection. Sometimes you're in the middle of somewhere like ocean or something where you don't really have an internet connection or a good internet connection. So that might be actually a problem. That's where IT edge computing comes to the image. Yep. So if we want to just uh, explain edge computing in a few words, we can say that edge computing is there to improve operation and cut costs. And talking about that, we need to have a definition. So as IDC said, edge computing is a mesh network of micro data centers that process or store critical data locally and push it to a central data center or cloud. So edge computing allows data that are produced by the IoT to get processed on the device locally instead of sending that across the network to somewhere else for processing as uh, IoT computing typically does. So edge computing refers to uh, the processing that can be done on the device. Uh, so it means that such devices have their own compute, network, and storage just in a smaller factor. 
And before we go any further, I really, really, really want you to remember one thing. And that thing is this part of this definition is that the edge computing is a mesh network of micro data centers. And that's an, kind of an important thing. And we'll see that in a, in a few, few moments. So just for now, just kind of hold on to that thought, a mesh network of micro data centers. Um, so since we've mentioned the positive and negative sides of a uh, IoT device or IoT devices in general, I probably should mention something uh, similar when it comes to IoT edge devices. Uh, well, I mean, compared to IoT devices, they uh, do address quite a few issues that you see with, with IoT devices. So they have even lower latency because, well, because they don't have to send the data back and forth. They just process it. Uh, on the device, or most of it anyway. Uh, if and only if you do things correctly, it will also help you with the privacy issues so you don't have to ship all the sensitive data back and forth. Um, it will also give you a real-time or near real-time availability, data transmission, and generally productivity increase. Well, again, because you don't have to send data back and forth. And as I mentioned earlier, sometimes you don't you don't even have the kind of the privilege of being able to send all that data. Sometimes you're generating way too much data for the bandwidth that you have uh, that will not even let you do that. And that's that's an interesting thing. So that's where the edge devices kind of come to shine. But not everything is good there either. No, when it comes to edge computing, so there is no redundancy. It means that if our device falls, we lose our data and we actually need to replace the device. But if something like this happens in the cloud, we can just start a new VM and we have possibility for backups. And when it comes to security, there are two different arguments. On the one side, we can say that uh, such devices are more secure because they keep data on the device and do most of the processing on the device. So there is less data in communication with third parties, which make it uh, more secure. But on the other side, we can say that uh, it is less secure because the device itself can get attacked much more easier. So in designing such devices, we have to think about the access control, use of VPN, and encryption of our data. And to put this, to kind of pull this uh, comparison of IoT and IoT edge devices a bit further, I'd like to show you this drawing of a typical home that you might have. And I mean, it's very, very convenient and very nice. You have lots of smart devices. You might have smart speakers, smart um, uh, lights. You might have smart coffee machine, or whatever, and, you know, all those kind of things. But I mean, the problem is that it kind of, bring some challenges to the table as well, to into your home. And this is kind of one of the challenges that you have. And I think this tweet describes it really well. I'll just read it aloud for those of you who cannot uh, see that uh, well enough or cannot uh, uh, read that. So. Uh, the, 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 this tweet is just, uh, my, my wife asked why I uh, was speaking so softly at home, and I told her I was afraid Mark Zuckerberg were listening. She laughed, I laughed, Alexa laughed, and Siri laughed. So <laughs> it's kind of a bit crazy scenario, but this is kind of the world we're living in now, and there's a, kind of ways to contract that, at least... Uh, some people try to figure them out, and uh, this is uh, one of the solutions but provided by uh, a, a very uh, nice comic uh, strip called XKCD, where they advise you to kind of going to new places, try to place orders to some crazy stuff. Uh, ask the home assistants to do like uh, really, really crazy orders. So in this case, it's two tons of creamed corn they're ordering. And well, you know, this is one way of figuring out who's listening, right? Uh, but if we go back to this kind of smart home example and uh, the, think a bit more kind of serious, put the jokes to the side and think a bit more serious about that. So the thing is, when you pull up your phone and press a button on an app and um, 
turn on the f lights on and off. It happens so fast that you don't really think about it. It's almost like flipping a regular switch on your wall. But in reality, it's uh, uh, there's a lot of happening there in the background, right? Your phone talks to a, a network talking to some kind of gateway. That gateway talks probably to some uh, kind of cloud and sending something to it. Uh, it's cloud sending something back. Then the gateway sends something to uh, 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 your lights uh dimming them or changing color or turning them on and off and things whatever you asked it to do but then the thing is that this happened so fast that you didn't really think about it but in reality there is a lot of data going back and forth and the same thing also happens with uh, our assistants that we might, might might have at home. When you ask it ask it to do something or ask it a question, it will go all the way to the cloud, process it, and send it back. And as we've seen issues like a privacy issues and leakages of uh, pretty much all of those assistants having some kind of uh, problems with breaches and stuff like that. And if that would have been a, uh, an IoT Edge device or a bit smarter device that would do most of those processing things on the device, we would actually not have much uh, as much problems with the privacy and stuff like that. And well, you might think, well, it's just turning on and off the lights and stuff like that. How sensitive can that be? But you know, sometimes it actually can be the sensitive thing, right? Yeah, it is really helpful. Like these home assistants are really helpful, but the problems comes up when we just come uh, when we combine these information sources and connecting them to a specific person, time, or location. So that can make it a bit risky. Yes, and well, uh, when we kind of introduce the main uh, concepts, we, we kind of need to mention uh, fog and a cloud as well. So when we usually do this kind of talk, we um, do it in front of, well, as you can say, live audience. Uh, so people in the room, and we usually ask them to raise their hands if they've heard of fog uh, in this context. And uh, usually that would be in a packed room, really full room with several hundred people in there. It would be like one or two hands, maybe three. Um, then we kind of to to make sure that they're actually listening and you know following what we we're saying. We also ask them to. Uh, raise their hands if they've heard of cloud, and then everybody would be like raising their hands. So uh, I guess it's very important to mention what actually the fog is. And the fog is, is basically what you see, everything you see here in blue. So this is kind of the connecting, uh, uh, anything that connects uh, all those devices with each other and with the cloud and why if you remember i uh, asked you to remember to 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 remember to hold on to that thought of um, um, a mesh of micro data centers and now you can think of iot edge devices as micro data centers and you can think uh, uh this fog as this connectivity mesh that connects them together and uh, lets them offload some uh some load uh like do some load balancing in between of those tiny little data centers, or what we can call them the data centers in the reality, is tiny little chips. But so they can actually offload some uh, some some work to each other, and they can also talk to each other, and they can also talk to the cloud. That is what fog basically is. So to just sum up the difference between these terms, edge computing can be any devices such as home assistant or a network system. Uh, it actually refers to the computational process that can be done on the edge device, while fog computing is the connection, the network connection that is needed to transfer data from the device to its final destination, which is cloud. And on top of that, we have cloud computing that can be some servers, data centers, or you can call it some other computer. Yes. And well, now that we have the kind of the basic uh, stuff uh, introduced, we would like to go deeper into this IoT Edge domain. And to do that, we have to go back to our real life example. This example that we asked you to think about in the beginning of this talk. And we had these four uh, simple uh, uh, concerns or simple requirements that we wanted to, uh, your. Uh, system or the system you're designing to comply with. So the privacy concerns, high performance, low latency, and low cost. To do that, we needed to start somewhere. And we kind of had to start with a device. 
there are some companies out there that have already made a hardware for that. Both Google and Microsoft have a hardware, while AWS has a software and operating system that can be run on different devices, such as ESP32. And there are also some more general devices, such as Arduino, Raspberry Pi, and Banana Pi, but they are not actually designed to run AI on them. So let's see, talking about AI, another thing that make edge computing more interesting is that it makes it possible to run AI and machine learning on them. And uh, because edge computing compared to the cloud has limited resources. And so to bridge the gap between edge computing and the cloud, some companies have also built some devices with purpose-built accelerators that the way that these devices work is that they have a tiny chip that takes over the most expensive and heavy part of the calculation and that will end up to just speeding up the process. So it will free the CPU and RAM and you can use those for something else. Uh, yeah. And speaking of AI accelerators, because I mean, <clears throat> as it's been mentioned already, there is no power in those things. There is no crazy process processors and stuff like that. They're actually by design made to be tiny little things that are, uh, very uh, little power uh, hungry, so they don't use that much power, they don't produce too much heat, they don't do all those kind of things, they're quiet and you know, all those kind of things that are totally against the whole thing of the power of the processing of, I mean, have you ever been to a server room and heard how, how, how much, you know, fans and everything and cooling and all these things that you have there? So uh, we had to look into this AI accelerators and we started with uh, these three devices that were kind of the main uh, competitors for in, in our uh, eyes. And uh, so the first one was NVIDIA Jetson. It's basically a tiny little uh, computer, uh, the one chip computer uh, with its own operating system, Linux uh, like operating system and extra uh, chips doing this AI uh, accelerator uh, accelerator thing. Uh, while uh, apart from that, it's pretty much the same as a Raspberry Pi or anything like that. So it would have like USB ports and HDMI connections and you know all those kind of things that you would normally find on a tiny little single board computer thing. Uh, the second one was uh, Intel uh, Movidius Myriad uh, based. Uh, device and that device is actually a bit different so it's not a separate computer it's not has uh, having its own operating system or anything like that it's actually a uh, USB accelerator it's a stick like uh, like this and uh, well it, up there you can see a, a USB uh, connector so you plug that thing into whatever you might want to use it with so it can be a Raspberry Pi it can be a laptop it can be well anything. And uh, the cool thing is actually you can connect several devices uh, like this together. So you kind of uh, plug them all in and they kind of are able to distribute the load between them and do processing of uh, neural networks and stuff like that. Uh, <clears throat> the third device was a Google Edge TPU, so Coral. Uh, those actually come in two different flavors. So they, they come as a dev board which is a, a device like uh, similar to the NVIDIA Jetson, like in, in, in the build ways. Uh, it's a separate computer with own operating system with like own one chip device like this. So this is a dev board, how it looks like this. You can see it better even on the next picture, on the next slide in a second. Uh, but um, so this is one flavor. The second flavor is this, and this is a uh, USB accelerator kind of version of that. If we can get that thing focused. Um, yeah. Uh, so um, the chips inside of those are similar, but uh, this one has no operating system. So this one will need a host, a Raspberry Pi or a laptop or anything like that. While this one kind of comes with everything. Um, so, the way it looks and a bit more close up and without me kind of shaking my and you know waving my hands in front of the camera this is how it looks and uh, uh, it also has a, a camera module that you can connect to it that looks kind of like this and um, and uh, well 
you know, it's a computer, it's a Debian-based operating system on it, and it can do uh, pretty much uh, whatever the regular computers can do. It also has a uh, very similar hardware as uh, a Raspberry Pi. Uh, so the same CPU, same architecture, ARM architecture, and all those kind of things. It's actually pretty much the same dimensions as well. Um, you might have heard actually about TPUs before. Uh, speaking of uh, those, um, so the TPU that is on this device, this is this tiny little device that does the all the um, uh, um, uh, neural network processing and things like that. Uh, it, it's a very, very, very small device. So it's, you, you can see that the chip there compared to a penny that is a very, very small in, to begin with, and that chip is even smaller. Um, this is probably not the TPU that you've heard of. The TPU you've heard of probably looks like that. So this is um, a TPU Cloud Edition, and, and this is actually not as big as it normally is. It's actually just one eighth of it. So if you if you actually use it on the cloud, uh, you will actually be talking to a, uh, a cluster of those, cluster of eight of those, actually connected together. So. This is actually a pretty well-grown man standing next to it. And then you can think of it, eight of those there standing there. And so the power is totally different, but the power boost it gives you, even with a tiny little chip and a device like, uh, like this, uh, to a hardware similar to Raspberry Pi and stuff like that, it's totally different. We'll see that in a second. Before we do that, uh, we need to introduce a few uh, terms when it comes to kind of processing video and stuff like that. Yeah, for our implementation, we needed to learn some terms such as classification, detection, and tracking. In classification, we know what kind of object we have. And in detection, we know what kind of object we have and where it is on that image. So we know the coordinate of our uh, object. And in tracking, which is quite similar to detection, but the difference is that in detection, there's only one image. But in tracking, we have a series of images, and we need to keep tracking that object. So. In our example, I can um, show you that we have, uh, if you can uh, go to the next slide. Yeah, here we have some dogs. And in classification, we know that we have dogs and not cats. In detection, we know what kind of uh, object we have and the exact dog that we are talking about and where it is on that image. And in tracking, we know what like where our dog is start moving uh, without mixing up with other dogs yeah <laughs> and i think we need to um uh, show you another example of that i think it's uh i think this one is a bit more uh real life kind of example this is actually running uh, this is a recording of a tiny little system that we've made uh, that's running on this device. Actually, exactly this one, just with the power connected to it. And uh, you can see here that it's been obviously inspired by this uh, famous uh, hot, uh, hot dog, not hot dog application. We expanded it to, uh, to, to do also hot dogs and dogs. Um, and here you can see actually the difference between uh, the... Uh, uh, the classification and detection. Uh, so uh, in, in some of the cases, it will actually say, well, it's just, I see a dog or I see a hot dog. And some of the cases will also draw a, a, a square where it thinks it sees those. And also it's interesting to see, we're using here two different machine learning models. Uh, uh, one of them has a concept of uh, humans. It has a concept of animals, other animals than dogs. Uh, and stuff like that, but some of them don't. So in some cases, you will actually see that it also recognizes a person and draws a square around it. In some other cases, it will also uh, misinterpret a koala uh, to be a dog because it has no idea what it is and it kind of looks like a dog to it and will just say, well, I think it's a dog. Uh, and also we we'll, we show the certainty of how certain it is if it is a, a koala or a dog or something like that. Um, so the uh, important takeaway here is that different models will be trained to do different things. And it's kind of up to you to train them or use the uh, 
kind of already trained models, but kind of be aware of what they know of and what they can recognize. And so you don't get this kind of uh, strange and interesting results sometimes. Um, why video processing is uh, difficult? So all the way since the animation and the whole video concept was uh, invented, uh, it's been since late 1800s, there was this guy called Edward Maybridge that, uh, that started the whole thing. He put a bunch of images on a spinning uh, thing, a drum, and would spin it really fast and would give the viewers the impression of that horse moving. And um, this uh, has been animation ever since, pretty much. The only thing that changed is that we got a bit more colors, we got a bit more uh, uh, bigger pictures, uh, better pictures, but also they've been kind of switching and replacing one another uh, much faster. So the frame rate got uh, increased as well. Um, so video is a stream of images and processing images, we know we can do that. Uh, we can do that with machine learning models. They're very efficient. They're even efficient on small devices like this. Uh, that is fine. But then we have to do tracking and tracking is kind of tricky and very, very CPU intensive because you have to correlate all those frames with the previous run and you have to keep in mind what you have seen and compare it to what you see now and compare it again and again and again and see if it is actually the same object or something new. So if you kind of explain it in a video uh, example, so say we have a 10 seconds video and we have um, a three, uh, 100 frames so because it's 10 seconds video 30 frames per second in total is a 300 frames uh, so if we see two people there moving on on that picture uh, if I ask any one of you in, uh, in in this talk to do that you will probably probably will not have any problems uh, counting those at all. Uh, if I ask a computer to do that, it will be a totally different story because, well, it has to look at all those frames and it will just analyze all the frames and count the number of people. It will probably end up with, well, two people on each frame, 300 frames, so 600 people, which is not true, right? Uh, <clears throat> and then if uh, those people move and also the third person appears, uh, it will also uh, need to recognize that it's actually third person, it's not person that I've seen before, and count it as, a, as another one. So now we have three people on that video. Um, it's very, very challenging and very uh, CPU intensive for a computer to do, while for us humans it's very simple and easy, because we have this concept of context, which, well, we don't have in a video. And yes, here we can see the process. We start from capturing an image from our camera, then we resize an images, our images because our machine learning models use a specific size of the images. And then we run machine learning models on top of them. When we have the result, we display it. So here is an example where you can see the system in action in the next slide. If you can go to the next slide. Thank you. And so here we run a model on a live uh, video feed and you can see that it can detect our object and you can see how accurate it is. So you can see that Rustam and I are more human, obviously, than the picture on Rustam's access card. And you can also on the left corner see that the inference time is 8 milliseconds and we can process 120 frames per second. So it means that we go through all those Four main steps in the previous slide, just in a uh, mean, just in a few milliseconds. So it happens really quickly. And in the next slide, we can show you the difference between uh, such devices, de devices with TPU or without TPU. Yeah. So what's happening on this uh, video is actually it's again being run on this device, exactly this one. It's record screen recording of this thing, uh, where we're processing the uh, the the stream of cars, not people, but the same thing, uh, uh, with a TPU that when it goes really really fast, and also the same 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 device uh, where we do the same thing with a. Uh, 
a CPU. So remember, the CPU on this thing is very similar to a Raspberry Pi. So processing that video on a Raspberry Pi would kind of look like this with a few frames per second, uh, while uh, the same device with a tiny little extra chip just doing it really, really well and going from few frames per second to, I think, 60 or 70 frames per second uh, that we have there. Um, so it's actually quite fun and we learn quite a lot of things and we learn some things that might sound a bit obvious right now but uh, it's not very obvious when you're working with this thing and one of them uh, is that uh, different machine learning models will actually have different performance you don't really care and think about it when you're processing uh, batches of data and you just process it in, in batches it doesn't really matter if it takes another minute extra or less when you're processing like millions of images Images and stuff like that. But when you do the same operation over and over and over again, many, many, many times a second, uh, you really need that performance. You really will feel uh, those milliseconds uh, in, 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 on, on, yeah, on your skin. And, and you will feel the difference of these different models. Also, different models will have different uh, uh, objects recognition kind of uh, concept. So some of them might give you false positives of really strange things and things we've seen like with koalas and dogs and stuff like that. Um, another thing that is also kind of obvious uh, is that you should not put, put much code into your synchronous part of your program. Uh, putting things like print statements and stuff like that will mess up your performance. I went from uh, 70 frames per second to two or three frames per second by just adding a few print statements while debugging thing and uh, things and then you know couldn't really figure out what killed the performance and then I, I finally found it and it was two or three print statements hidden here and there and well again you have to optimize optimize and optimize over and over and over again um, you might think if it was a smooth sailing developing this kind of uh, project and play around with this uh, or 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 if it was not and uh, the thing is that we got this thing um quite early so it just got into bet beta when we got it and uh, it was a bit uh challenging to begin with and also as you can see i don't know if you can on the slide uh, on, on on the picture on, on the left side it's actually a screenshot of uh me trying to build a huge C library uh, on, on this thing with one gig of RAM and uh, trying to add a 16 gigs of swap, basically a card that you can see here, that's the 16 gigs of swap uh, that I had to add to try to make it uh, run. It did not, just so you know, it failed miserably and, uh, but well, we failed so you don't have to. So, there are better ways of doing things like that. But, you know, we tried and we've been playing around with this. And we've, we've learned quite a few things. So was it actually smooth sailing? Well, in reality, it was a bit more like that. It was a bit cloudy, uh, wavy, and thunderstormy. And also, uh, at some point, we were kind of starting to lose our minds and had no idea how things were working and why, why things were failing. But that was back in the back almost a year ago. Now we've learned a lot. We know how things work. And we uh, we we have uh, a much better working system. So at the end, it probably was a kind of smooth-ish sailing for us. And finally, I think I'd like to say uh, thank you from both of us. And thank you for uh, coming to our talk and uh, also uh, please feel free to find us, to follow us on Twitter. That's our Twitter handles. And also ask us any questions uh, both here and also offline on, 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 on through, through the social media and stuff like that. Thank you very much. Thank you.